All right, thank you everybody for coming. Um, my name is Jonathan Solomon. I'm going to be uh, talking about commoditizing high speed, high bit rate uh, contribution over, uh, over internet. Uh, quick background, I'm a senior sales systems engineer with Aspera. Uh, I've been with the company three years. I was a customer for six years before that. And I've uh, been in broadcast engineering for about 20 years now. So I know both the, fi the, the, IT si the IP side and the uh, SDI side is uh, what I tell people. Today we're going to talk about um, the background and trade-off. I'll give you a little background and trade-offs of, of existing solutions for today. We'll talk about the contribution challenges for, that exist today and the limitations of the current technology. We'll also talk about the future of high bit rate contribution, and I'll introduce you to the Aspera Fast Stream for Video solution and give you some use case examples. We'll have time for some questions at the end as well. So what is considered contribution quality, broadcast contribution quality? It's, it's high quality, high bit rate video and audio. It's highly reliable connectivity with minimal delay and of course reasonable cost. Well, all, those, all the solutions today require a trade-off and you only get two out of three. So if you're doing Major League Baseball, World Series, sorry for the uh, San Francisco fans, uh, you don't care about the cost. You're gonna take the two out of three, the high quality and the high reliability. If you're doing a tier three sporting event, you're gonna take reasonable cost and maybe high quality, but you're not gonna worry about the delay and the reliability. So two of the three are available in all the solutions today. But the golden thing is the middle of that Zen diagram, right? So before we go talk about what we can do tomorrow, let's think about what we did yesterday in the past. So there are some of you here that prob probably remember TV1 circuits. Analog circuits, you had to call up the telco, get it dropped, a lot of lead time, never worked. But that's how we used to do contribution video a long time ago. Then we moved in the world of satellite, 45 megahertz transponders, roll the truck up, worked pretty much every time. And soon we had fiber. You could get fiber almost anywhere you wanted, but it was costly. But you could move on compressed video. And this was the first time we could move on compressed digital video, revolutionize the quality of contribution for, at the time, broadcasting. Then we figured out we could compress it. We could put it on a satellite or on a fiber, get multiple feeds on a single channel, bring more cameras back. Suddenly we introduce HD, SDI, and we can compress that as well, use the same circuits we've been using for years. All of these are not cheap. They're all costly, right? They take, take a lot of money, a lot of planning to get that stuff there. And then the HD circuit kind of rode on top of the, of the 270. It's a 1.5 uh, gigabit per second. That's a typo on the slide, sorry about that. Uh, 1.5 gigabit, so you could do uncompressed HD or a lot of compressed SD and HD if you wanted to but you were still restricted in location on that. It was still costly. Well, then dedicated IP came along. MPLS, managed, managed networks, specialized carriers. Again, limited availability, high cost, but you don't have to encode to uh, ASI. You could do IP. Um, again, a lot of limitations there. In the old days of copper, you were very limited. You had to be near the central office. Today, you can be anywhere you want as long as there's an IP connection, but you're still sacrificing quality. So we use, still use the same core technologies today as we have in the past, dedicated and proprietary transport mechanisms. We've got a satellite I spoke about, very expensive. That cost is out of reach for many, especially for long form, uh, long form programming. It requires a large physical footprint. At best, a van. At worst, a C-band is a trailer. It's difficult to integrate with online production tools. So you can have all the tools you want on site. You can bring all the people you want. You can pay for the hotels. And you can do everything you want, make a composited package and bring it back, and then put it up on the satellite. But you can't really take a satellite down into a random location or into the cloud and process it and do something with that signal. And it's not very available on demand. There's some use cases where you can get it on demand, but uh, at the end of the day, you have to do some planning. High-speed fiber and dedicated circuits. Long-haul WANs can cause uncertainty and degradation in quality. Most dedicated circuits, you're not going to see the degradation, but there is some uncertainty in there. And it's not widely available at many venues. It's all the major sports venues. A lot of hotels have it. Major hotels have it for that, do big events. But you can't go to a high school and get a fiber drop in there very easily. Again, planning and cost. So another solution is CDNs. CDNs are kind of the opposite model of these, but they're very high cost, uh, but you can, it can be worth it if you do it over long periods of time. 
It's a reverse CDN model where you go to the closest node, of course, and it distributes to all the nodes that people want to see it, even if it's just one person. But it does work. So why is this so hard? It just can't be that hard, right? You just bring a satellite truck fiber, no money, no time, right? Instantly. Why is it so hard to get it easier and cheaper? Well, IP-based protocols, there's network protocol limitations. TCP and UDP have limitations on distance. They have limitation on um, capacity sometimes. It's very hard to make that work at, at high, high bit rate contribution. Now, you can correct that with FEC and other error corrections, but there's a cost to that. There's a cost in bandwidth. It's up to 25 times. We'll talk about that in a minute. There's varying availability of connectivity. You can get connections pretty much anywhere for, uh, for a network connection, but not all sites have the services needed to run dedicated infrastructures or fiber. So public internet available, managed services, not so much in all the venues, at least not in a reasonable amount of time. Strict security requirements. Systems that encode and decode are often on completely separate networks than the internet. So you need to use proxy to get it through. You need to have a, a way to, to proxy the, the content through to keep your system secure. And you also need to have a way to encrypt it and to authenticate your sessions to make sure the users coming in are correct. That's the biggest concern over the public studying stuff over, the, over public internet, is that someone is going to get it. They're going to intercept it. It's a valid concern, but there are ways to mitigate that. Moving on, the ever-growing demand for higher bitrate content, 4K, HDR, VR. VR can be up to 16K. That's a lot of bits. Even at HEVC, it's a lot of bits. It's a lot more than most, uh, most things can handle today over, over public internet, commodity internet. Siloed systems. These are systems that are all self-contained or use proprietary protocols, which limits the interaction between systems. They often have a, a way to interact with a standardized protocol. For example, you might have an edit silo. All the systems talk to each other. They can't talk to anything else, not from a network infrastructure perspective, but from a protocol perspective. So you have to be able to ingest that in a way that, that edit system supports. Cost measures, you often have to decide between quality, which can be costly, and price, which can sacrifice quality. And the biggest one, and one I find almost all the time in my day-to-day -day, uh, work, is change is hard. Why would I want to change something? This works. It's worked for 40 years. I don't need to improve it. In fact, I like my job a lot. I don't want to take a risk and make a change. That's the biggest one to overcome, right? That's a personnel issue and not a technical issue. So what's the future of higher bitrate contribution? Is it continuing on satellite, on fiber? Is it MPLS and managed networks? Simple. Use commodity internet. But I just told you all the reasons the commodity internet is bad. Let's, let's talk about why it's good. So why is it good? It's pervasive. It's everywhere. And it's cheap, even on short notice. It's inexpensive compared to dedicated circuits, even for business class circuits, which can give you some sort of QoS on the, on the bit rate available. It's inherently bidirectional. All the other services I talked about could be bidirectional, but you have to buy two circuits. You gotta buy an inbound fiber and an outbound fiber. You gotta buy an uplink transponder and a downlink transponder. Internet, it's always bidirectional. It's easy to send a return feed in the same time you're getting a contribution feed. And it's always on. I could plug into this network cable right here, which I plugged into this computer, and start streaming, right? So it's great, it's easy, easy to do. So, how do you do this over public internet, right? Why is it bad, why is it good, but how do we make it work so that it works well? Well, we've been doing file-based transfers over the internet for years. Voice over IP works just fine. Intercoms, control, everything works over the internet. Why not video? Well, the answer is because up until recently there wasn't really a way to do it that was reliable and cost-effective. So let me introduce and talk about Aspera's fast stream technology. Aspera's fast stream technology is based on a protocol that's been around for quite a while, about 13 years now. Um, that is pretty much, it is distance agnostic and pretty much bitrate agnostic. And what I mean by pretty much is we haven't found a way to break the transport protocol with, a with over 100 gigabits per second. So there's no concern that we're gonna run out of bits for uh, contribution video. It's a glitch-free, near-zero startup, and what that means is there's not gonna be a problem in the video. It's gonna be clean video all the time, no, no buffering, no stuttering. And when you start, when you get a signal going up, it's instantaneous and it's as live as you can be. 
there's obviously delays in latency induced with encoding and decoding cycles and transport, but it's as live as you can be. And most importantly, it doesn't matter what the data is. The fast stream protocol could be used for logging data, sensor data, or video data in this case. And video data is just data. It could be 4K, it could be HD, it could be SD, it could be VR, AR, it could be HEVC, it could be H.264, it could be whatever the next great codec is that comes along in five years. It doesn't matter the bit rate, it doesn't matter the resolution, it doesn't matter the uh, frame rate. It's just moving data. So we're moving data over the internet at reliable speed, that's with reliability and speed. Now, the fast stream protocol does other things besides video. I mentioned the data, it also does growing files. It also handles ABR. So it does a lot of great things that almost everybody who's doing streaming video needs. And most importantly, it's got some great API capability to embed into products, which we'll talk about in a few slides here. So how can it improve production? It's great, so maybe we have a tool now that can actually do this. How can it improve production? Well, you can build highlight reels remotely. You can ingest your cameras from, from, a, from a sports venue back into a central facility where you have great editors, and you can build this highlight reel and not have anybody on site to do that. Send it back to the production truck, send it off to a show, so on and so forth. You can do live transcoding and OTT release. So to date, there are ways to do live transcoding. You take a satellite feed or a fiber feed in and you put it into a magic box that captures it live and does build your, uh, build your HLS and dash stack. But you can just do it over commodity internet now. It's way cheaper and have instant access to it. You can also do open file workflows. So files are coming in, and as long as the system that you're working with supports open files, you can immediately start working with it in the past or now. Obviously, you can't work in the future. It's not that fast. But most importantly, it lowers the production cost for all events, especially tier two and tier three events, so that you can create more content for those lower level events. Tier one events, oh, they're always gonna use, for the, near, for, for the near future, they're gonna use private proprietary systems. But tier two events, there's a lot of events, tier two and tier three, that are being recorded and available later. If the cost to put them on air live is lowered, you'll get more viewers and you can do more shows. So some of the advantages, obviously, is um, predictable streaming at the rate you specify. Assuming the bandwidth is available, of course, that's the key. The packet loss and RTT rate are insignificant to establishing the stream and maintaining the stream. As I mentioned, the startup delay, that's really how long it takes to get the signal usable at the receiver. That's all it is. It's not a buffer. It's not a delay between live and almost live. It's just the time to get the, the startup going. So it's, very, it's very, latent, uh, very low latency, highly low latency. Uh, lowest possible bandwidth overhead. Now, this is really important. With FEC, you could have 25 times over, overhead on your, on your files, on your uh, stream. So if you're doing a eight megabit per second stream, that's gonna fill up your 10 meg pipe. Well, if you get rid of FEC, you can either do a 10 meg stream and improve quality, or maintain your eight meg stream, and if you're doing it over a LTE connection, reduce your costs, because you're not sending as many bytes. Low probability of drop packets. We, uh, the fast stream protocol drops one packet about once a day at a 45 megabit per second uh, stream. Why did I pick 45 megabits? It was a very standard stream, for a very standard bit rate for a long time. That number goes lower as you go lower in bit rate. So at six megabits per second, it's almost a week before you'll see a drop. And you get the highest possible effective throughput through the highest possible encoding rate. What that means, you can do J2K easily, if, provided you have the bandwidth. You could theoretically do uncompressed HD, uncompressed 4K, again, provided you had the bandwidth. And of course, it integrates with any workflow. So it could be a standard workflow on premise, bring your content back in, put it into an SDI switch it router and route it around and switch it. A virtual workflow, which is somewhere else that you bring up and bring down as you need it. Cloud processing, bring it into a cloud, transcode it, distribute it, feed it to a CDN for delivery. You can do file delivery workflows based on it. You can ingest it, make it a file, and then send that file off to somebody for later processing. Or you could do an all internet people collaborating from around the world, getting, the, getting this, the feeds they need at the time they need it. Let's talk about how we can be integrate, how this can be integrated with products. I mentioned the API before, and now I'll show you about it. We don't really need to talk about how to integrate it. We can actually talk about how it is integrated. 
So we'll start with Telestream. Most of you know what Telestream is. Their light speed live capture device allows you four SDI, in, uh, SDI inputs. You can either do four HD or quad 4K, and it encodes it. And Lightstream, Lightstream, uh, Lightspeed Live can do a bunch of things once it's encoded. And in this particular uh, drawing we have up here, it is sending it to a far-flung place for live capture. So it's being ingested into an editing system, maybe Avid, maybe uh, Premiere. It's also being recorded locally for a safety copy, and it's being archived in the cloud, all from the same box, all using FastStream, because FastStream can support the ability to go at 50 megabits per second over long distances with high reliability and no loss at minimal cost. The second integration I can talk about is with T21. T21 is an encoder decoder company, hardware company out of Florida. Many of you haven't heard of them yet, but they're up and coming. And they've integrated FastStream into uh, their product as well. This is a really great use case. You take an HDMI or an SDI source, it's a drop down unit. You plug in your internet, Comcast, Fios, Charter, Cox, whatever you're using this week, and you put in the IP address of the remote unit, which again is just plugged into home internet and suddenly you can do 4K right across the internet for very, very, little, bit, very little money and not needing a, uh, an integration or calling up a knock or anything like that. Very high speed, very secure transport, two endpoints, three endpoints, whatever you'd like to do, and it's very simple, to, very simple and very inexpensive. So I have a few use cases to talk about to maybe bring this, uh, bring this all home and wrap it up. The first one is uh, the executive producer of a, a major talent competition that will be televised cannot consistently be on site for tapings. So they need a secure and protected solution to provide 4K to the executive producer whenever the show is being taped, no matter where the executive produ producer is. They could be in London, Miami, Toronto, New York, Singapore. They just need to be able to get the content and watch it. So deploy something as such as T21, 4K, 40 megabits per second. The theater has plenty of bandwidth. As long as the executive producer is in a facility that has adequate bandwidth to receive this, they can plug it into the 4K monitor that they bought at Best Buy for $400 on sale, and they can watch the show live, no delay, with high quality. The end result is no limit to the recording day and times of the show, no major cost for dedicated circuits, makes everybody happy. Second use case. Regional sports conglomerate wants to reduce its cost to, and time to air for highlight packages and, and post-produced programming for in-program, post-game, and studio shows. By using the Telestream uh, Light, Light Speed Live I uh, showed you earlier with the embedded fast stream, they can bring eight feeds back, seven cameras and a program feed, <coughs> excuse me, over a 200 meg circuit to a central facility, use craft editors there, and then send the content back as needed. They can do that over many venues, five or 10 venues, consistently with the same craft editors on site, not the point craft editors at all those locations. So this is a faster to air, improved quality with advanced editing and cost savings with fewer technicians. Excuse me. <coughs> Third one, host broadcaster is uh, hosting a major sports finale competition in a neutral city. They want to bring back feeds from viewing parties at both the home and away teams. Again, public internet, plug it into a, to the uh, internet at a bar, feed it back, and integrate it into the, into the production. Make that available to all your broadcasters, and everybody can localize their content. <coughs> Excuse me, and finally, an analyst for a sports or news talk show wants to be able to contribute in real time without delay and see the content that they're being talked about. So again, using encoders with embedded technology, they're able to send the video to the uh, production facility and get the highlight reel back or the video they're talking about back or just the, do the interactive two-way with the hosts as well as the announcer and the producer's audio back. So higher quality, reduced costs, and the ability to do it at any time of the day, any day of the week. You can support breaking news without having to call up a knock and establish a connection between the two. So that's the presentation on, commodi on commoditizing contribution uh, video over, uh, over internet. The summary of that is it's possible to do it today with the right technology so you can reduce cost, provide higher quality, 
And as that higher quality is needed to meet consumer demand, such as 4K and, and beyond, you can provide that to them from origination, live. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take them. Awesome. Oh, yeah, you got a question. Thank you. Yeah, uh, all that's great with the internet working perfectly, but when the internet squeezes down from your maybe a 30K connection and all of a sudden it jumps down to about 10 for any number of reasons, or maybe down to two, how does your how does it handle all that? So generally speaking, we're going to talk about something that something that has I um, don't want to call it a QoS because it's obviously not a managed circuit, but I wouldn't want to realistically have my analyst use his home Comcast connection. I'd want to make that some business connection so there's some guaranteed bandwidth in there. But to your point, uh, there is the ability for it's important for the uh, it's important to have the protocol to have the ability to interact with the encoder. So that in the event there's a, a substantial constraint, it can tell the encoder to throttle back. It can recognize a constraint, tell the encoder to throttle back and say, hey, I was doing 30, but something's better than nothing, go down to 10. And then go back up when we get, the, when we get it back. Um, that is a big discussion among uh, dedicated circuits versus commodity circuits. Um, but I'll tell you from my experience, I have Fios at home, I have 85 megabits per second, I'm constantly doing tests. I never see a constraint that bad. I have seen a constraint that bad with other providers, so your mileage will vary. Um, but there's two ways to look at this. One is I want to bring my major, major minor event in. Well, you're going to make sure you have guaranteed bandwidth, right? Whatever the contract is to that is going to be guaranteed bandwidth. The other after that is I don't care what I'm doing. I want to be able to deliver it without, with decent quality for, say, for example, news. So in the something better than nothing category, it doesn't matter what bandwidth you have, you'll be able to still better quality than not using a protocol that can make the most use of it with error correction. Is there another question? Awesome. That means I did a pretty good job. So thank you very much. Hope you guys are enjoying the show.